Welcome back. Rodents are nearly at the bottom of the food chain, and they act as such. They utilize their senses to stay hidden in the spaces we don't have access to or care not to enter frequently. In a classroom, that could be overhead in a drop ceiling where roof rats and mice frequently visit. Norway rats are happier on the ground in underprotected areas like portable trailers and would oftentimes build their burrows near garbage cans and dumpsters. Rodents tend to follow lines, keeping their whiskers or vibrissae touching walls and fence lines to be sure that they are protected from the predators that want to feed on them. Rodents in general are opportunistic omnivores and will feed on the natural food sources available in their environments, like seeds, snails, fruits, and nuts. They will all readily feed on food sources that we provide them, especially bird seed, dog food, and other accessible grains. Both rats will take advantage of improperly maintained refuse areas, so these primary sources of rat populations must always be actively managed and monitored. Rats are considered to be neophobic or fearful of new things and foods. This fear of new foods is a function of how much food is available to them. Once these other food sources are removed, rats will readily accept rodenticides and baits on traps, so these measures should always be used in tandem. The home range of rodents are the fixed areas that these animals forage for food, mate, and care for their young. The size of these home ranges will vary depending on the environmental conditions within them. The more food, water, and harborage that is available, the smaller the home range and potentially the larger population that will grow within that area. Norway rat home ranges have been found to be from 25 to 450 feet. Roof rats from about 100 to 300 feet and house mice living in a small footprint of approximately 30 feet. In a typical school setting, this means that rats may originate from outside the school boundaries and feed in neighboring backyards, restaurant dumpsters, or open fields in natural areas. When they find a reliable food source, however, on the school grounds, such as the dumpster or well-meaning but misinformed local cat feeder, rats may establish a nearby harborage and grow their families to exploit these resources. Rodents may disperse or migrate from their home range when disrupted by cleanup campaigns, construction, or changes in the outdoor conditions, like our regular droughts when landscape irrigation is reduced and the landscape cover outdoor dries up. Before you catch a rodent, you're likely to find its droppings. Droppings can tell you a few things about your unwelcome pests. If they are dark, black, shiny, and malleable, they're fresh. Once they become dull and crumbling, they've been there a while. The size and shape may be helpful in narrowing down the species. Norway rat droppings have a blunt end like their muzzles. The droppings are about three quarters of an inch long. Roof rat droppings are more pointed like their muzzles. The droppings are about half an inch long and mouse droppings are the smallest at about a quarter of an inch and are pointed. Droppings are a good place to set traps. They tell you where the rodents have frequented and where they may return. If you think you have roof rats, however, look up. Those droppings may have fallen down from the top of a cabinet or a structural beam overhead. Set your traps in their runways. Don't count on a roof rat to come from its runway in search of the bait you set in your trap. Once you catch a rodent, you can confirm your identification. It's easier to ID mice from rats based on their size. Immature rats are similar in size to mice. However, they look like puppies with oversized feet and dopey noses they grow into. Norway rats have short ears and tails proportional to their bodies. So Norway rats are the bulkier ground dwelling and swimming rats called sewer rats or wharf rats. Roof rats have longer tails and bigger ears. Roof rats are the tree dwelling and attic rats. To tell the difference, drape the tail over the body. If it passes the nose, it's a roof rat. Or you can bend the ears over the eyes. If they cover the eyes, it's also a roof rat. So German cockroaches aren't as prolific today as they used to be, since we're doing a lot less food production in most kitchens. Uh, but they still are the number one pest for our kitchen areas. They may be brought in by uh, students in their backpacks or staff or on deliveries. Don't confuse German cockroaches with field cockroaches that live outdoors. These cockroaches may come inside and be an aesthetic nuisance, but they don't infest the inside of buildings. So you really want to take a, a preventative approach to them and not be using pesticides to control field cockroaches indoors. Uh, a common outdoor cockroach is the oriental cockroach. That's what we saw earlier today in the valve boxes. Uh, these cockroaches like to be in very damp places. When they come inside, it's usually through an open door or uh, gaps under the door. Uh, and that's the primary solution to them. 
when necessary, you can treat those valve boxes outdoors. A new emerging cockroach that we have is the Turkestan cockroach. These cockroaches look similar to the oriental cockroach, except for these little white stripes that the female cockroach has on the side of her body. Uh, the male cockroaches also have a very light colored uh, stripe on the side of its pronotum. Uh, and then the last, uh, uh, another cockroach that we have in California that's fairly new is the three-line cockroach, or the friendly cockroach, as uh, it's called colloquially. Uh, these cockroaches look very similar to the German cockroach, except they live outdoors. These cockroaches can become a nuisance during the summertime, when, uh, during our route, when they, our droughts, when they um, come in search of humidity and, uh, and moisture. And then last, uh, we also see uh, brown banded cockroaches. Uh, this is something that we have less frequently in California, at least from my experience. Uh, and you find them in uh, very strange places up high away from uh, food sources typically, uh, like behind uh, wall hangings and uh, door frames. And then the last cockroach that we may encounter in California is the American cockroach, the biggest, baddest roach that we have. These uh, cockroaches live in sewer systems. If you have these cockroaches in your building, you have some uncapped sewer pipe uh, that it's emerging from. So ultimately that's the solution, is to find uh, those sources and to close them up. And then this poster uh, was created by the University of California, uh, UC IPM Extension Office. Uh, it's available online. Uh, search Common Cockroaches of California, UC IPM, and help support our UC system. Our goal should never be to harvest pests. It should be to control the ones we have and stop the production or reintroduction of new pests. Rodents and cockroaches have prolific reproductive rates. No pest management tactic alone is enough to stop them before they leave their droppings, urine, and frass that poses a real health and liability risk to both the school and PMPs. Combining sanitation with pest management tactics is our best practice that decreases our liability and reduces the frequency of pesticide applications and exposure potential. School personnel are ultimately responsible for maintaining safe and clean facilities. PMPs can facilitate good sanitation and effective pest management by reporting sanitation conditions in writing. Get in the habit of identifying the conducive conditions associated with any pest findings you make with any actions you take in writing. This is how Branch 3 wood destroying organism companies fill out the reports, and so should we. Sanitation issues are unsurprisingly not hard to find. Anywhere that someone has to crouch, bend, or reach to access is a place that will likely be missed when it's time to clean. Pay attention to the dead or blocked corners of a room. These may be cluttered closets or behind oversized furniture that keeps a vacuum or broom from, be from getting behind. Look at the transitional areas of a building, junctions between the building where the floor meets the wall, or where different wall surfaces meet are oftentimes where seals break down and cracks and crevices wind up. In these crevices, food debris and other detritus often accumulates. Never forget that water is the source of life. Know that if water is present, there is some form of life making use of it, oftentimes pests. Kitchens are obvious hotspots for pest activity. Pay special attention to the drains. If it's an older school, the floor drains may not have the floor sinks that are easier to keep clean and remove food. Some floor drains may be almost completely sealed up from the biofilms that build up over years of pouring filthy mop water down them. Get to where the pests are. Look under and between workstations, at the feet of heavy equipment, and in any hollow areas where water and food waste can build up and sustain any number of pests. Hotlines are ideal environments for cockroaches. Check for grease buildup and other food residues and use a spatula to scrape some off to show the responsible staff what they may have missed. Waste areas are obvious places to look. Pay attention to the areas under and around dumpsters and beneath garbage cans. These may be a source of rats or outdoor cockroaches. And don't forget the locations that students and administrative staff spend their time. Break rooms, gymnasiums, and administrative offices can collect old snacks that become rodent buffets very quickly. You may consider selling an annual IPM assessment to look for those conditions proactively. Most often, however, sanitation conditions will be something you find and associate in writing when addressing pest issues that come up over the course of the year. I look forward to seeing you in session three.